Hey, OM System Nature Photographers. I'm going to share with you today three simple but very effective tips at improving your autofocus subject acquisition and maintenance. So let's be honest, when you're out in the field and you're trying to get some great shots, maybe there's a great bird flight, some great action with some mammals, and you can't get autofocus acquired or you're struggling with acquisition or keeping it in focus, nothing can be more maddening. And, and I know that because I see it out in the field all the time and I'm leading workshops. So stay tuned for our three tips that I think are really going to help you improve your autofocus performance with the OM-1. Hey, nature photographers. I'm Lee Hoy, OM System Ambassador, photography workshop instructor for Wildside Nature Tours and Precision Camera and Video, and contributing author for the Journal of Wildlife Photography. Here we go. All right, guys. Well, I'm looking forward to sharing you today's tips. I'm getting ready to leave tomorrow to head out on a on a trip to get to Yellowstone and Grand Teton, where I'll be there for over a month leading some workshops. I love being up there. Winter is my absolute favorite time in both of those parks. Of course, I'll have my trusty 40 to 150 2.8 with an ungripped OM-1 on uh, one side of my Black Rapid strap. And on the other, I'm going to have my very trusty, the beast, the 150 to 400 with an OM-1 that is always gripped. I, When it comes to wildlife photography, I always want a grip on my longest lens because I love to shoot vertical. When I have smaller lenses, shooting vertical isn't quite so challenging. You know, I've got these little short, you know, Scotch-Irish hands and fingers. So this isn't a problem with a lighter lens. But I find that when you have a grip, A, with the 150 to 400, that grip is going to give a little better balance. When, they're, when it's ungripped, I feel like it's a little front heavy, just a little bit. Not a lot, but a little. So for me, you know, I know that when I'm out in the field, one of the things I see my clients struggle with the most by far is acquiring subject in focus and maintaining focus. And they actually employ some techniques that make it more frustrating, that, 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 that hinder their ability to do that. You know, one of the things I'm often talking to beginning, intermediate, advanced photographers is be sure and set yourself up for success. And there's a lot of ways we can do that. Too often, beginning and intermediate photographers are actually setting themselves up for failure. Now, I'm going to be the first to say you learn more from your failures than you do your successes. But it's frustrating when all you're experiencing is failures, right? So let's walk through these three tips that I think are going to make a big difference for you in your photography. So the first tip is going to be the autofocus limiter. No, not that one. I know what you're thinking. You're thinking about the switch that you find on the side of many lenses that will let you, generally you have three options on your autofocus limiting. Let's be honest, those ranges are mostly so broad, okay, that nobody ever uses it. But what they do, they accidentally hit it and change it and miss shots, and that's very frustrating. I frankly would love to see the autofocus switch taking off uh, the limiter switch removed from lenses for that reason because it's so broad it's really not that helpful and particularly with the OM-1 we don't need it how come well let's jump right into our OM-1's menu so we're going to press the menu button okay we're going to use the front dial to quickly get over to the AF menu group that's green so that your menu items are color coded in the OM-1 and what I like is, of course, I like to use the directional pad then for maneuvering from one menu page to another. Not menu tab, but menu page. Okay, you can use the joystick or the directional pad or the arrow pad, you might call it. And we're going to get to page three, AF, and we're going to go down in the middle there to AF limiter. You may not realize this, but you have a digital autofocus limiter in both the OM-1 and the EM-1X. And this thing is powerful. Let me show you why. When we're in our menu, you'll see that there are several options here, okay? And I'm going to talk about when you might use this, but let's talk about what this feature does first. Obviously, if we want to turn this feature on, we go right here, and we can choose the distance for we've set for on 1, on 2, or on 3, okay? I'm going to leave that for off for just for a moment. Now, I've already got distance 1 set from like 15 to 25 feet. I could come down here to on 2, and I could say, you know, I want to limit it from 25 feet to let's say 30 feet and for all you people that do it wrong whoops I'm gonna set it here to 35 okay and I'm using the directional pad to do this for all you people that do it wrong you can change it to meters <laughs> that's just a joke get all my European Australian fans all worked up but you can do meters or feet right so that's going to be, I could have that setting for number one, and then I could leave this where it is. You know, I, I, I rarely use distance for three, but I can tell you there are some times where you might want to do that. 
All right. But let's talk about so so we know how to set our distance. The beauty of this setting, it's only going to limit your focus from 15 to 25 feet. Think about it. We could get so specific, we could say from 15 to 15.1 feet. That's and, and it will only focus in this range. You were talking about speeding up autofocus radically. Okay. Now release priority, what that does, that determines whether or not you can take a picture, whether focus is acquired or not. If it's on, it will let you press the shutter button when focus isn't acquired. I always want on, turned on when I'm using wildlife photography because sometimes you might have focus, lose it for a second, and we're still holding down the shutter button and then reacquire it quickly. I don't want a delay in there for my camera saying, ooh, I can't take a picture right now. That's me. I'm a control freak. Okay. Now, let's, and, and then finally, if we're actually going to turn this feature on, there's a couple of ways we can do it. We can come into the menu and then select whichever distance, like on one. Then when we press the shutter button to get out of our menu, if you look here now, in the upper right side of your viewfinder, you'll see the green letters AF limit. And that means it's turned on. Now, you know, when we could go into our menu to access it, or you could program a button to do the same. So I program a button to do it. And I use, on the front of my OM-1, okay, the top button, I reprogram because I don't care about depth field preview and I don't even care about the other setting that's on there. I don't use them. Auto, you know, the white balance change, I don't, I don't use that. So you can see it disappeared. I press that top button. Boom, boom, it goes away. Now, if I press that top button and I spin my rear dial, I can then go in and select my different options. So I can turn it off. Of course, it's easier to just turn it on and off by pressing the button. Or I can use my dial and I can go from on one to on two. Boom, just like that. So that's a much easier way to get access to this when you're in the field. I don't know that you necessarily need to program it to a button because you're only going to use this in very specific settings or circumstances. Let me explain. There's not time. Let me sum up, right? Now, the, the reality is, is if I'm going to be shooting at a blind, maybe you've got a backyard bird photography setup. Maybe you're with me or another photographer to workshop in Ecuador or Colombia or Panama, you know, where there's a lot of bird blinds. Maybe you're at a ground blind in Africa for mammals. And you roughly know the distance. And when I sit at a blind, I don't take a tape measure. I look and I say, you know, the, the, the general field here looks like it's maybe, you know, 15 feet to 25 feet is where I think birds are going to be that I want to photograph. That's where nice perches are. That's where it's going to give me good backgrounds. I don't care if a bird, how rare, how unusual, if it's sitting way off in the back in an awful area. I don't photograph birds to document them. I don't photograph birds because it's a new species for me. I'm a professional wildlife photographer, and I photograph for great images. I don't care if it's a house sparrow. I, sure, I love seeing things for the first time. Sure, I love photographing unusual or rare things. But I don't care. I'm looking for great images of whatever happens to be in front of me that day. So we get in a blind, and I look out, and I think, you know, I think 15 to 25 feet is going to do it. Well, I set my range in my menu, you know, and then what I'll do is I just quickly, can I focus there? How close can I focus? How far can I focus? And I usually ballpark within a few feet. Okay, I, I might need to reduce the front focus. You know, maybe I had it to 15. That's that's too close. Maybe I need to be at 18 feet to 25 feet. Great. So I just real quickly, you know, boom, boom, boom. Or if I try to focus on a feeder and I can't, I know I'm not giving myself enough distance. So maybe I would be better off at 20 to 25 feet. And then I set my, my distance. And now I'm only going to focus in that area. And my focus acquisition is going to be huge. It's going to be so fast. If you're doing high-speed hummingbird flash photography, you're staying at the same distance generally. You know, So if you know you're only going to want to shoot within about a foot of the, the feed or boom, set your autofocus distance limiter and your focus acquisition will be outstanding. All right. So those are some of the times where you might want to use this. Or if you know you're on a beach and you're really not worried about the birds way out in the ocean, use this when you can have the patience and the discipline to focus within a set area. Yeah, but Lee, I want to photo photograph everything. Well, you're probably not worried about getting great images. Then don't use this feature. I don't care. But if you really want to maximize your autofocus acquisition at the proper place, the proper time, this feature is one of the most powerful auto autofocus features you can use, okay? All right, so let's talk about our second feature that we can use on the OM-1. You cannot do this, unfortunately, on the EM-1X. 
I shoot in manual exposure mode 100% of the time. I grew up shooting on a Canon A1 with a broken meter, did all the calculations in my head. With live highlight alerts and shadow alerts and live histogram, photographing in manual exposure is easier than ever. Okay, So I don't need exposure compensation button. It's a complete waste of time and space. Not space, because I'm going to show you how I do use it. Complete waste for me to leave it set as such. So the exposure compensation button is right up here on top of your OM-1. Right? So now if you do use manual exposure and you are using exposure compensation, that's probably one of the silliest combinations I've ever heard for. I'll look forward to the haters' comments below. Auto ISO is from the devil and it was designed to screw up most of your images. Oh, I know. Haters are going to hate. I don't care. I'll delete your comment. I got evidence. I'll do a video for you at some point on why auto ISO is so bad. So now that I got y'all riled up, for those of you that still want to learn, follow along. Okay? I am going to reprogram that button to turn AI subject detection on and off. Okay, let me jump into the menu and show you how to do that. So I'm going to press the menu button on my trusty OM-1, and I'm now going to use the front dial to spin quickly to get to my custom menu. That's the one with the gear, or gold, or puke orange. I'm not sure what color that is. The ladies will be able to help us out on the colors. I'm going to go into button settings, button function, and there is my exposure compensation button, the first one, the plus minus. I'm going to press OK. Now, I already have my button programmed, but this is the one you want to select. It's the box with the four corners. At the top, if I move around, you see the description of the button. You're pro the, you'll see the function that you're going to program the button to. So it gives you the button and then the topic of what you're going to program. In this case, subject detection. And then it gives you a guide. If you press, you can turn on or off subject detection. So press to switch subject detection on or off. And then it tells you if you press the button and then turn the dial, it will change the setting. Let's get out of this, okay? We're going to set for subject detection. I'm going to half press the shutter button to exit the menu, or I can press the menu button to, to back out, or I can half press the shutter button. Now you'll notice the bird icon there at the top of my viewfinder, okay? If I press my exposure compensation button, watch this, turns it on and off. That is beyond useful because there are times where I don't want subject detection on. That's not the point of this video. I'll talk about that later. So with just a quick press of the button, I can turn it on and off. Now if I press that button and I spin to the right, I can turn on mammal subject detection. I refuse to call it dogs and cats because I'm not photographing domestic animals, okay? So I can press that button and hold it down. If you just press and let go, you're turning it on and off. So we're gonna press, hold down. Now for some reason, if I'm on birds and I wanna to go to mammals, it's not one spin to the right, it's two. I don't know why that works that way, but once I'm in, then it's one, one spin of the dial goes back and forth. But if I'm out of it and I press that button, it's not one spin of the dial, it's two clicks. Think in terms of clicks. Okay, The first one requires two clicks, so if you're trying to do it quick, you want to make sure you move back and forth. Okay. Now, let me explain. I've done a lot of experimenting. I think this past year I've probably shot over 300,000 images. I have done lots of testing and bird subject detection works phenomenally well on mammals, reptiles, amphibians, and many insects. Sometimes you get insects with crazy compound eyes or other things that kind of blend in with the body and that can be a little bit of a challenge. However, bird subject detection works great on all those. Mammal subject detection is great for mammals, but it's not so good for birds and insects. Uh, it's okay. So if you don't have time to change back and forth, you're better off being in bird more than you are mammal if you're photographing a wide variety of subjects. Okay. Obviously, if I'm in Africa, I'm going to be moving back and forth as I can. If I can't, I'm just going to leave it on bird for a little bit, but I'm pretty quick at getting that button changed. Okay. So that will be your second tip in how to make uh, you know, your autofocus subject acquisition and maintenance even better. All right, let's talk about our third tip. Okay. Now, I grew up hunting, and I'm going to get looking forward to some haters' comments down below. I'm from West Texas. Let me give you a hint, okay? We don't care. We don't get worked up. You have a ball down there. I'll probably delete it if it's dumb enough, which some of them have been. But don't care. I was a hunter, and I, and I love a good steak, so it's wonderful to sink your teeth into something real. So one of the things I learned through hunting, and I played video games for a long time in life, and I'm kind of looking back that I waste a lot of time. 
I can move a joystick. It gave me great hand-eye coordination. So it also helped me tremendously in my photography. Okay, And what that is, is I like to be able to, to acquire focus when you have lots of activity. Like I was at Bernardo uh, Wildlife Management Area, Waterfowl Management Area, north of Bosque del Apache, New Mexico the other day. And at one point, for about a, a half an hour to an hour, it seemed like, I had snow geese just coming in constantly right in front of me. Backlit, beautiful. Here, check out this image of it. Yeah, lots of cool backlit subjects going on. But to help me acquire focus even quicker, I don't drop my camera down unless you really need a rest, right? The best way to do it, particularly for moving subjects, is to keep your eye really close to the viewfinder above it, okay? And then if we have a moving subject, what we're going to do, we're going to follow that subject with our eye right above our viewfinder and then look down. And the, the, the subject should be in the viewfinder. It's a lot like using a pair of binoculars. You learn that if you keep your eyes on your subject and then bring the binoculars up, the subject's normally in there unless it's just completely left, right? But for acquiring a subject, it's best to keep your eye right above the viewfinder. Hey, Lee, what about the OM-1 sight? I don't want that. I want to be looking through my viewfinder at my settings, at everything. I, you can't see live highlight alerts using that point. It's silly. It, it defeats, one of the, to me, one of the most important aspects of the OM system cameras, and that's your live highlight alerts. So, no, I don't use it. I don't care to use it. I'm not going to try it. You're welcome to. So, that will really help you acquire your subject initially. Okay? So, those are going to be my three tips today for autofocus. Uh, tips on the OM1. A couple of them will work on the EM1X. I hope you've enjoyed this video. I look forward to, to visiting with you as I'll be up in Yellowstone and Jackson Hole shooting up there a little bit. Y'all have a good day and good shooting.